Good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm really uh, honored to have you here with my wife, Nancy, and my mom and I today. Um, it's a beautiful day outside. I, I love it. It's my favorite season, spring. We've been doing a little walking in the neighborhood, and I just love seeing the wild, the flowers, the tulips all coming to life, the trees blossoming, the apple trees, the cherry trees. We missed most of the cherry trees. We have our dogwoods yet to come. All around us, creation sings out praise to our God. Again, welcome. Let's begin with prayer today. Kind and gracious Father, I thank you for your presence with us, Lord. That even in the hardest of times, in the midst of the storms and the tumult, you are always with us. Even when heaven seems steeled over, you have not left us nor forsaken us. Because of your promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I pray for everyone listening and watching, both now and later on YouTube. I pray that all of us would know that sweet presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, that sweet presence of the Holy Spirit, that security of the love of God. Father, today we pray for your world. Sometimes words fail us, Lord. Your world is hurting, Lord. As of yesterday evening, 605,390 people have been confirmed to have COVID-19 in our country. And we have had 24,582 deaths as of yesterday. 24,000 families grieving. 605,000 families wondering if their loved one will survive. Father, I pray for comfort. But more than comfort, Lord, I pray that you would draw people to your kind heart. I pray that your word would be going out and would not return void. The gospel of grace, the gospel which promises us eternal life and salvation, redemption, reconciliation, adoption, justification, all which means we've been reconciled to you and given an eternal home in heaven. Father, I pray that you would be convicting the world of sin and us as well. That the Holy Spirit would be about convicting the world of sin. And I also pray that you would shine the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ into the world's hearts. so that they may know the one who has created them, so that they may know the one who has loved them and even sent Jesus into the world to die for them. I pray that you would lay bare the lie of evolution, that you created us. While we were yet in our mother's womb, you knit us together. You stretched out the heavens which can be measured by the width of your hand, the width, width of your palm. Lord, I pray that you would even be using this 
pandemic to till the soil of people's lives, letting them see once again what is really important in life and also how fragile life can be, that we are but earthen vessels, that we are but baked clay. And sometimes we are but broken shards of pottery, Lord. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would be poured out upon this planet in an extraordinary measure, calling people by name to come home, to entrust their lives to Christ, to call out, remember me when you come into your kingdom, to cry out, save me, Lord, save me, Jesus, to be fully persuaded that you are, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is deity in the flesh, that he is God in the flesh, the one through whom all things were created, and the one in whom all things hold together, and that they would be fully persuaded that they would come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who took the burden and the sin and the iniquity of the entire world, all of our transgressions, all of our rebellion, all of our selfishness, all of our self-centeredness, all of our self-aggrandizement, all of our egos, all of our pride in his own body and taking the full weight of the law, the just requirement of the law that required death for every sin taking that full brunt of the law in his own body taking the curse of the law that dreadful dreadful curse of the law into his own body your son, Jesus, gave up his life that the world might live. For you sent the Son into the world, God, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through your son, Jesus. So, Lord, that's, that's our prayer today. May an incredibly large number of people turn their hearts to you find salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ, believe the promise of life that to everyone who believes, they have eternal life. If there's anyone listening today, Lord, or watching today, I pray that you would, who doesn't know you, who hasn't entrusted their, entrusted their life to you, who hasn't been fully persuaded that you are the Son of God, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, I pray that they would come to believe today, that you would persuade them today, Lord. So throughout this day and throughout these coming days and throughout this season of the pandemic, may all of us be praying for this tired, tired old world. that people might find you, or better yet, that you might find them, Lord, because you seek the lost. You seek to save the lost. Thank you that you have found us and that you have saved us. And Lord, I pray that you would equip us to get your word out, that you would give us opportunity and open doors that you would give us words and utterance, that you would give us the very words to speak. And that when we speak, that you would give us clarity to speak. And lastly, that you would give us great boldness, not of ourselves, but of your spirit. Opportunity, words, clarity, and boldness. I pray that for everyone watching. May your word go out, Lord, and not return void. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you're all well today. You're all resting at home and enjoying the weather outside and just being together as a family. It's funny, we get so busy in our life that we hardly have time for each other. And now in one fell swoop, the Lord has put us all back in our homes. He's allowed, us, allowed this to happen. Spending time together as family, 
playing games together last night over the last couple of days, uh, Nancy and I and mom and Nicole have been playing phase 10. So we're on, I'm on phase nine, but we're having a wonderful time together. Nancy's just finished the puzzle. I helped her a little bit with it of Portland. Instead of griping about this time, maybe we should be thanking God for this time. I know there's a lot of heartache out there, worry about jobs and but Father, we pray that you would take care of all these things. Seek ye first the kingdom of, of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. And all these things will be added unto you. So we seek the, the king and we seek his righteousness, not our own, but his righteousness. Amen. So we're here to read Psalm 14. It's, uh, again, a psalm of David. Um. It says, for the choir director, a psalm of David, that must be, have been some kind of direction to the Levitical choir. The Levites formed a choir and they would sing. And so having uh, that this psalm is a psalm of David must have meant something to them. We, that has been lost to our understanding. But let me read through Psalm 14 and then we'll return and, and work through it verse by verse. The fool has said in his heart, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They, had com they have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all the workers of wickedness not know, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great dread, for God is with the righteous generation. There they are in great dead, dread, for God is with the righteous generation. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted. But the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation of Israel. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his captive people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be, will be glad. So then starting at the beginning, it says, The fool said, it, said in his heart, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. And so we begin with this very stark and certain and drastic, I, I wouldn't call it drastic, but it's a very stark phrase. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So anyone out there who's an atheist, who's, who proclaims there is no God, I can think of uh, some of the famous British atheists who've said there's no God, this new atheism that's out there. David, the psalmist, comes along and says, anybody who believes that is a fool. And so I, I, I think about that, that we have come to a time in, in the Earth's journey, in our journey as a people on the planet, where a whole lot of people don't believe in God anymore, that we believe in evolution, that we're here because of some primary primordial soup that by which somehow we evolved into these life forms that we have now become and it took millions and millions of years that's always a secret ingredient is millions and millions and millions of years and so I, I, I want to show you something I, I like making paper airplanes here's a paper airplane this is my standard paper airplane Jace and some of the kids at church after church, they often ask me to sit down and make paper airplanes for them. I don't always have time, but I try to if they ask me to sit down and I make each one of them one of these planes. And then they have fun throwing them around the church. This plane flies very, very well. It's, I learned how to make it in seventh or eighth grade in one, one class. Uh, while the teacher was out of the room, uh, somebody taught me how to make it. It flies really well. I can't show you because you won't be able to see it, but um, this is my favorite, one of my favorites. As far as aesthetic beauty, this is my uh, 
favorite as far as how it looks. It's a delta wing, I think it is, yeah, and it's it's a it's it's a very pretty little plane. This is made out of origami paper, so you get that nice beautiful color to it. But let's say you were walking uh, through the forest and you came upon this lying on the ground. You wouldn't think to yourself, well, that just happened by chance. You would think, wow, I wonder who folded that. And secondly, you would think, I wonder if it flies. And you may pick it up and try throwing it to see how well it flies. And this one flies really well. You can adjust these little flaps or wings on the front. And by adjusting them up and down, you can make them do loops and all kinds of fun things. But there's that plane. The point about these planes are that they have a number of steps put together or a number of steps that I had to follow to make them. If I get any of those steps out of order, more than a couple steps, you don't end up with a plane, you end up with something else, and it doesn't fly. So there is a series of steps that it took to make this. There is a plan, there's a design to it. Secondly, it has function, it flies. If I um, took this up in our old building and went up in the balcony and flew it, it would fly wonderfully. I have one more plane that, that I learned to make in sixth grade, and I folded that one uh, when I was in Boise, Idaho, and it was a wonderfully windy day on a, on a beautiful spring day such as this, and we were outside during recess or lunch playing, and I folded one of those planes, and I threw it, and the wind caught up, caught it, and it lifted it, and it, it, it just rose and rose and rose, and it went flying over the top of the three-story school building, and we ran around to the side of the building so we could see where it was going. And it went all the way across uh, Franklin Street in Boise and landed on the roof of the Safeway. I thought, wow, what a great plane. My point is, this has a series of steps required to, uh, to make it. And secondly, it has a purpose and a function. It also has a third thing. It has beauty to them. They're pleasant to look at. So in the same way, there is an intuition we have as human beings that when we see something designed, we go, oh, that's, that's been made. It's designed. And yet when it comes to the wonders of the human body, we say, oh, that's just a lie. That, that perception of that intuition of design isn't real. And one of the British atheists said that very thing, that even though all of creation gives out this strong sense that it was designed, that there was a gardener to the garden. We don't, with, with evolution now, with Charles Darwin, we don't need that anymore. Yet I think about who we are as created human beings. We have these eyes, which are incredibly complex. They're the most complex thing in our body, followed by our blood clotting probably, but our brains, of course. But our eyes are extremely complex where they take light and through a series of process, processes, processes in our eyes, it's converted into a chemi chemical signal, which is then read by the brain, in, in fact, inverting it so it makes things appear right side up, even though the light enters in through our lenses or however, upside down. And then once it's, it's righted, then you have a brain to interpret that information. So you have to have your eyes and all the... In, intricate mechanisms of the eye, which are amazing. And you have to have a brain to be able to interpret that information coming in. They can't be separated. They're irreducibly complex. But if you have a brain, you need the brain to get oxygen because it's a living thing. You need to get have it get nutrients through the bloodstream, which means both a respiratory system and a circulatory system. So you have to have lungs, you have to have a heart, you have to have the whole system of veins and a body to enclose it. So then you have to have skin. You have to have a frame to hang it on, the, the skeletal system. And in order to get that food into the system, you have to have a digestive system. And all of this is irreducibly complex if you take out one piece out of it. And then you look at our ability to reproduce. That's incredibly complex. When, when I look at a human being, and especially at DNA, realizing how much information is in DNA, it speaks clearly of design. It in, it's, it, there's that intuition for us that we are 
fearfully and wonderfully made. Just DNA itself. If you were to take your DNA and, one, and read one character per second, it would take you 96 years to read the wonder of who you are. And on top of that, the University of Washington has recently discovered another coding in the DNA uh, helix, that helix. There's another coding underneath the, the four letters, which seems to be the operating system. And even more recently, it seems that they have discovered another coding. And so even DNA, this information, is more complicated than any computer programs that we have known to humankind right now. And yet we say, well, there's no God, there's no designer. We are clearly designed. Just as you would clearly say, if you saw this, that's been designed, somebody's created that, somebody's made that, there's steps to make it, it has a function, it flies, and it's beautiful to look at. In the same way, we have been wonderfully and fearfully made. We have steps in our design that have to follow one after another from that first zygote, that first cell, and as it splits. Uh, and we have function. We've been made to love. We've been made to create and to make and to perceive that things are good. We've been made to be in relationship with one another and to reproduce and to have families. And lastly, we're beautiful to look at. Uh, I find sometimes we say that people are ugly, but I find anytime anybody smiles, you see the beauty of the creation in their face that inner beauty. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's plain, right? It's, it's as plain as a nose on your face because your nose is in, intricately des designed. There is no God. So this whole psalm now is going to be talking about this fool, this atheist who says there is no God. David's first pronouncement is they are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds, things that are abomination to God. There is no one who does good. And now he's speaking globally of the whole planet. So when he uses that word corrupt, it's, it's an interesting word because it's also found in Genesis 6.12. When the whole world had become so full of violence and corruption, God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupt their, their ways. Do you hear that for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. And then again from Exodus 32, 7, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. This is when he had been up on the mountain for 40 days. They thought he had been eaten by a wild animal or had died. And so they had Aaron fashioned for them in a golden calf. And the Lord says, Go down because your people, it's funny, God is saying, they're not my people anymore, they're your people, Moses, whom you brought out of Egypt, whom you brought out of Egypt. I didn't bring them out because of their grumbling and, and complaining now and their unbelief and their wild I idolatry. They have become corrupt. And I find it interesting that David chooses that word. They are corrupt. It's a corruption of the whole planet before the flood. It's the corruption of the people of Israel at the giving of the law. They have committed abominable deeds, deeds that are abomination to God, which he looks at with disgust and hatred, those deeds. And then that pronouncement, there is no one who does good. Paul takes these verses from this uh, psalm, and earlier we saw it again, I think it was in Psalm 6. He takes these verses and he threads them together in a pronouncement about the whole human race's predicament. And so just reading a couple verses from Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. That's taken from Psalm, I think it's, I mean from Isaiah 64, I believe, or 65, or maybe it's 55. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So we look again. There is no one who does good. And so he's quote, Paul is quoting right from this psalm. And then the rest of it is taken from our, our later verses, uh, verses 2 and 3 in Psalm 14. 
The Lord has looked down from the heaven upon the sons of men. Uh, it, it means that he's looking down at the whole of creation is, is the word used here. So this isn't just talking about certain people who are evil. This is talking about the whole world. All of us have corrupted our ways. All of us have been corrupt, have been corrupt in our inner being and that, that life that always thinks about sin and goes after sin in of ourselves. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. And the answer is they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. Who's become to corrupt together? Upon the sons of men, the whole creation has become corrupt together. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now he repeats that phrase. And again, we find these words in Romans. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do you get this? There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. There is no one who understands. That verse, both in Romans and in, in Psalm 14, is a haunting verse. There is no one who seeks God. Well, if that's true, then how do any of us find God? How do any of us seek him out and hear his word? When it's pronounced both in the Psalms and in Romans that no one seeks God. And it's speaking of the whole planet from the beginning of creation till the end of time. Well, here's the rub. If you go through the Gospels, you will find no volunteers for Jesus. This doesn't come from me. This comes from my seminary professor, John Weborg, who said, I challenge you to find one volunteer for Jesus. There are only those who are found and called. So some point in your life, you were found. Jesus persuaded you and you came freely to believe. But Jesus found you and he called you. And maybe today, such is this time for you that Jesus is finding you today and he's calling you. It's something that Paul and David are asking us to believe. There's nothing to do about it in, in, other than to seek to turn our life over to God once he's given us understanding. What a predicament the world is. I, I see a world where there, where there aren't people seeking God. Even in this pandemic, pandemic. When 9-11 happened, for three months, everybody in the United States was saying, God bless America. Everywhere you went, it was God bless America, God bless America. In that catastrophe, people at least remembered God. I hear very little of God bless America today or of conversations of turning to God at all. I think in those years since 2001, 19 years, we've become even more darkened in our understanding. In the midst of this pandemic, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to wake up and turn our hearts towards home. Turn our hearts towards the Creator. Ask Him to reveal Himself to us. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. We have to, together become worthless. So the Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is anyone who under, any who understand who seek after God. And the answer is they have all turned aside. Together we have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do you remember when the rich young ruler comes running up to Jesus? If you remember that story, it's found in Mark, I think chapter 10, and in Matthew and Luke as well. But Jesus is just ready to be departing on a journey when the rich young ruler comes up and he falls on his knees. He's in desperation, wanting to know how he can interpret, inherit eternal life. And he says, good teacher, what must I do to inher inherit eternal life? And Jesus kind of slaps him in his face with his words and says, why do you call me good? There is no one good but God alone. And I think, well, wait a minute, Jesus, you are good. But Jesus is living as the perfect human being, wasn't claiming his own goodness. 
but his Father in heaven was the only one good. There is no one who does good, not even one. I think this is the, the stepping stone to understanding the authentic Christian life. If you haven't understood this, then pray that you will come to understand it. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Or I am the vine, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, she who abides in me and I in her, she it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. We've been completely corrupted. And we think with the lie of lies that we can be as God, that we are gods, that we can produce a righteousness which is pleasing to God, that we can produce a life lived that is pleasing to God. And the pronouncement of these verses, both in Psalm 14 and again in Psalm 53, which almost re repeats this psalm verbatim. It's a little bit different, but read Psalm 53. You'll find all these same words. And in Romans, there is no one who does good, not even one. When you come to, ap to apprehend that you are not good and your goodness will never get you there, then, then the only thing we can do is turn to God and say, save me, Jesus. I'm in need of your grace. I'm in need of that kind, unmerited, undeserved, generous power of God to forgive, save, and transform my broken life. We move on. Do all the workers of wickedness not know? It's a rhetorical question. And the implied answer is, no, they don't know. Or yes, they don't know. Do all the workers of wickedness not know? These atheists who would say, there is no God, they are without knowledge. They are without knowledge that is as plain to you and I in front of our face, as plain to you and I as the nose on our face. All around us, there's this intricate design in everything we see. When I listen to the American crown sparrow, beautiful, beautiful bird song, it dawned on me, well, maybe the Lord revealed to me, I wasn't listening to just bird song. I was listening to the song that God had wired into that bird. And all around we see this wonderful design, the beauty, the functionality, the ability to reproduce, creation singing out glory. And yet these people who say there, there, there is no God, these fools who say there is no God, are without knowledge. Do all the work wicked or the workers of wickedness not know? And these workers of wickedness are the people who eat my people as they are bred. They just consume people. They use people. They eat them up. And they don't call upon the name of the Lord. They have no need to call on the name of the Lord because in their minds, they are gods to themselves, believing that lie from the garden, which is repeated in Romans chapter 1. They exchange the truth of God for the lie and worship the creature rather than the creation. Worshiping the creation rather than the creator is what I mean to say. And so what happens when you are without knowledge that you eat God's people as though they were bread and you do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great dread. Deep down inside an atheist's heart, there is great dread because deep down in our hearts, we've been given the knowledge of God. It says that in Romans chapter 1. We are without excuse. All around us is the signs, is the intuition that we are wonderfully designed. And so they live in dread, this kind of haunting terror that they have set themselves completely against God. They don't call out to him. They persecute the, the very people who have entrusted their lives to God and to Jesus Christ. For God is with the righteous generation. As we've seen before, who are the righteous? Those who have entrusted their life to Christ, those who have received Christ, those who have been persuaded to believe 
that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. It's an irony to me that the more we say we don't believe God, the more our inner life screams at, at us that there is a God, and the more these people's inner life screams with terror that there is a God. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted. These atheists would put to shame the very thing that gives counsel or, or wisdom to those who are afflicted. So there's afflicted people in the world right now, and the atheists say there is no God, removing their hope, removing any encouragement from their life. Instead of turning to God, the atheists say, you don't, there is no God, you're just a fool for believing it. And by saying that, you put to shame the counsel that comforts the afflicted, that encourages the inflicted, that builds up, that gives them some hope for the future. Who are the afflicted? Well, in our day, certainly we Christians are afflicted, as we've seen in 2 Corinthians over and over again. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not struck down. Persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. But the afflicted are people all around the world who are afflicted by power, by abuse, by sexual perversion, by nations who act unjustly towards them in the distribution of food and, and so on. But get this then, in, in response to this, these atheists who remove that good counsel from the afflicted, but the Lord is his refuge. David is saying, but the Lord, Yahweh, Jesus, is the afflicted's refuge. Are you afflicted today by this pandemic? Are you afflicted by all the other things going on in your life? Do you feel like you're in the wine press and you don't know how you can stand another day? Yahweh is our refuge. Jesus is our refuge. And there's no better place. I know some nights when I wake up in the middle of the night and I consider my own life and not just the pandemic but everything else going on in my life. In those moments, actually in all moments, all I have is Jesus and he is enough. He is always enough. I find such encouragement in his presence. I've suffered from migraine since I was eight years old. Some of you have migraine, you know what they are. I've gotten so sick and in so much pain from a migraine that I just wanted somebody to shoot me, just put me out of my misery. And in those times when I was in such pain, all I had was Jesus and his presence and to cling to him. Migraines became a school of faith. Migraines became a school of living in God's presence. Turns out they were a blessing in my life that taught me to lean heavily on, upon our God. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted. Do you realize that when they do so, they are setting themselves against God? Because God is the one who counsels the afflicted. But they are saying there is no God, and so they're removing that counsel, that wisdom. And David says, but wait a minute. The Lord, Yahweh, Jesus, is our refuge. He's everyone who's afflicted's refuge. He doesn't throw out bruised reeds. He doesn't throw out burning wicks. He cares for all of us especially when we're in the midst of affliction. He, Jesus, upon the planet, walking, saw the crowds, and he looked at them and saw that they were without a shepherd, and he was moved with compassion for them because they were sheep without a shepherd. The Lord is our refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel 
would come out of Zion when the Lord restores his captive people. Jacob will, re will rejoice. Israel, Israel will be glad. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. And so the Hebrew per people were looking for a Messiah that would come to save the nation of Israel and that this Messiah would come out of Zion. And so it makes me think immediately of Zechariah 9.9. 9. I wouldn't have known exactly where this verse is, but I remember that it, it talks about Zion. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. The daughter of Zion are the people of Jerusalem. Zion is the city of Jerusalem. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. So there we have that parab parable or that parallel. O daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. During the time when Jesus was on the planet, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, weren't looking for a gentle savior. They were looking for a warrior to come riding into Jerusalem on a mighty white war, war horse. Instead, they got this gentle savior riding on a donkey, on just a colt. Not exactly the picture of a conquering king with no idea that he was coming to conquer our sin. Now people want a gentle savior coming, riding on a donkey. But we know when he comes back, he will be riding on a white war ho horse. This text in Zechariah 9.9 is quoted in Matthew 21.5, which we just celebrated two weeks ago on Palm Sunday. Say to the daughter of Zion, to the people of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He's not coming with to meet our designs. He's not coming to fulfill our plans. He's not coming to fulfill our will, but his own. And so it says, oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion, that Messiah. When the Lord restores his captive people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. It's strange, but this is written by David somewhere around the 10th century B.C., before Christ. And so this is long before, what, 300 years before Israel going into captivity, before uh, 500 years before Judah going into captivity. And so the captivity it's spoken of here, maybe it's a bit prophetic, prophetic of what's to come, but that captivity it's speaking here, of which it's speaking, is the captivity to sin, the captivity to the devil, the captivity to death. When the Lord restores his captive people, and that would include the entire planet, because that's what uh, the, the psalm is directed towards. Jacob will rejoice. Israel will will be glad. Jacob is another, is the founder of the nation of Israel. Israel is another uh, name for Jacob. So by saying both names, they're talking about just Jacob himself, but also the whole people of Israel. Predominantly that whole people of Israel will rejoice. And we along with them. So I think of a couple of verses that speak of this restoration of captive peoples. In Colossians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14, we read, for Jesus, he, or for God, I'm sorry, for God rescued us from the domain of darkness, from the kingdom of Satan. Let me get a little drink here. Of coffee, that is. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness. God rescued us from the dom domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. We were in Satan's kingdom, not even knowing we were in his kingdom. And then through the mercy of God, that persuasion that he did through his word, we've been brought into the kingdom of his beloved son, the kingdom of Jesus, in whom we have redemption. Redemption is a, is a word that, that was used in the slave market of somebody purchasing a slave for the full price and then taking that slave and setting them free of their slavery. No longer slaves in whom we have redemption. What were we sold into slavery to? To death, to our iniquity and sin and transgressions, and to the control and power of the evil one. 
In 1 John it says, We are children of God, but the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. And so our prayer is that people will be transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of God's beloved Son, Jesus, that they might find redemption and forgiveness. That's that salvation that Psalm 14, verse 7 is talking about. Or again, in, now we actually told how that comes in Colossians 2, 13 and 14. When you were dead in, the transgress, in your transgressions, which means to transgress, to go beyond the boundaries of the law, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, meaning that your, your flesh is without restraint. He made you alive together with him. A lot of pronouns there. God made you alive together with Jesus, having forgiven us all of our transgressions. Do you know that when you come to Christ, all of your transgressions are forgiven? You receive a fullness of the pardon for all your sins, past, present, and future. We sing it in the song, It is well with my soul. Not the our sin, not the part, but the whole. We've been pardoned. And I think until you fully re realize and accept that fullness of your pardon, you will continue to struggle. How urgent it is, how important it is to accept the fullness of the pardon. Does that give us license to sin? No, with Paul I say, may it never be. When I realize the fullness of the pardon that he has given us, I am drawn close to his heart. I want to, I want to camp out in his arms. I want to camp out in that ever ever present love of, of God the Father and of the grace of Jesus and of that abiding friendship of the Holy Spirit, having forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt, which literally is the handwriting that was against us. We say that this is a Roman certificate of debt. I know it can be that, but I think there's a word play here because the handwriting that was against us, that's what it says literally, was the Ten Commandments. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, which we've been reading, it calls that Ten Commandments the ministry of death. Having canceled out the certificate of debt, that handwriting which was against us, consisting of, agree of decrees against us, that same word is used in Ephesians 2 to speak of the law, those decrees. And so we're, we know that what we're talking about here is the Ten Commandments and the full weight of the law, which was hostile to us. Well, I would like to use the image of a speed limit sign. When you're on the freeway and the speed limit sign says 60 and you decide to go 68, suddenly that speed limit sign is against you. I found that out last summer when I hit 76 on the freeway and the police officer pulled me over. Suddenly that speed limit sign was against me and so was that police officer because I was breaking the law which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way. He has taken our sin, and he has taken the just requirements of the law with all of its decrees that were against us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So Pilate put above Jesus' head, this is the king of the Jews, but he was, and that he was being tried for sedition. But really, Jesus was being tried under the law, he took the full weight and brunt of the law in his own body and met its just demands, met its curse. And when he died, our sin, all of it, died with him and we've been completely forgiven. That's the salvation that the Hebrew people were waiting for, that Zion, Jerusalem, was waiting for. And then one last verse, how do we obtain this? And that is for by, from Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace... For by this undeserved, unmerited, kind and generous power, it's power, grace is power to forgive, save, and transform broken and sinful lives forever. Grace, you cannot merit it, you cannot earn it. It's kindness to us. And it does the work, we don't. For by grace you've been saved through faith, through belief, through trusting. All those words are translated from the same Greek word. And this is not your own doing. So your salvation and your faith, the this refers to both, is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. So even our faith, according to Romans 12, has been measured to us, an allotment of faith. I know we believe freely, but it's because we've been persuaded by God. 
I don't understand exactly how it works. But not because of works, not because of any of our goodness, not because of any of our righteousness, not because of any of our works, lest any person, lest any woman, lest any man should boast. So how are we saved? By the grace of God, through our believing in Jesus. It's that simple. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes, she who believes, has eternal life. And then we we don't just abandon living then. We want to live into the fullness of what it means to bask in the love of God, that boundless, immeasurable love of Christ in our life. Oh, that salvation of Israel. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his captive people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. This has already happened. Jesus has already come. The Messiah has already touched down on the planet. He's already restored us. He's already redeemed us. He's already justified us, made us as if we never committed the crime. He's, we are acquitted. And our response, after having com come to believe and after we have been persuaded, we rejoice. We are glad because we know our future is certain. I think sometimes we denigrate the promise of life as Christians. We kind of relegate it to something that doesn't really matter anymore. We got to be about this life and worrying about doing all the things in, in this life. In this pandemic, suddenly the promise of life has become foremost in many people's thoughts. I know that in my life with stage four cancer, that promise of life for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That promise has become very near and dear to my heart that God is faithful and he will never break his promise. It's the gospel, folks. It says in Paul, in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and following, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is a, a different gospel, but there are those who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, contrary to that was, which was preached to you, let him be accursed. I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that, the, not that there is another gospel. There is one gospel, folks. It's the gospel of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the gospel of the hope of heaven, the gospel of the hope of eternity, the gospel that one day you and I will pass from this earth and we will meet Jesus face to face and we will run into all those arms long awaiting my mother and father and your loved ones who by grace and through faith have found themselves in the very presence of God. Take this psalm out. And, and read it through. And while you're at it, take out Psalm 53 and compare it. They're almost identical. My response to this, our response is to rejoice, to be glad, because the very thing prophesied in, in verse 7 has already come to, to pass. We are forgiven. We are redeemed. We've been given the peace of Christ that passes all understanding. And no matter what happens, in this pandemic, no matter what happens to your life or to my life. We have a sure and certain hope because the one who promises us is faithful. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for the encouragement of the Psalms, for the encouragement of this Psalm, which turns out to be a messianic Psalm at the end, a condemnation of anyone who would say in their heart, there is no God. 
and it also a, a prophetic word at the, about, about the coming of the Messiah, about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, about this sacrifice of sacrifices, this once and for all sacrifices by which Jesus put away our sin. And we give you praise, Lord. We rejoice. We praise you. You are more awesome than anything we can ever conceive. Thank you, Lord. So again, we just ask, do your good work in the world today. Not our will, but your will would be done. Your will be done, Lord. Again, not our will, but your will be done. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. I uh, really enjoy looking at these psalms. It challenges me to dig deep and to do more study than I've been doing in a long time. I really enjoy digging deep into the Bible and reading with understanding. Not just reading it to read it, but reading it with understanding to understand what, what the Lord is speaking to his people as a people of Israel, and then secondarily to us as a people of a new covenant. Tomorrow, I won't be here. I have a pastor's meeting that meets at the same time over Zoom. Our local cluster, cluster our local covenant pastors cluster group uh, meets tomorrow at noon, and I'm actually leading it, so I won't be here. But I'll be back on Friday with Psalm 15. And then again, next week, uh, we'll be continuing this journey into the Psalms. I hope you've been enriched today. Again, take a look back, even read back through some of the Psalms we've already read and let them be an encouragement to you. Again, thanks for joining me. We close with a benediction or a blessing. From Revelation chapter 1, verses 5b and 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. To him be glory and power forever and ever. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for coming.